we're going to talk about the special relationship for a bit, and then we'll open it up to any questions you all may uh, have. And we've got one of, let me just sort of say, so I've worked for four presidents, for four administrations. And I would say pound for pound over those years, the British Embassy, or to be more specific, the Embassy of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, I always thought was the, the most talented and influential uh, embassy in Washington. There were times when it was as if they had a seat at the interagency table. They were, they were so informed about what was going on and so plugged in as to when to make their, their recommendations. And there were also times where the embassy played an extraordinarily important role in Washington. It, it was one of the very few safe spaces where Republicans and Democrats, co people in Congress, people in the executive branch, what have you, would come together. Uh, in, a, in a city that's become increasingly balkanized, I actually thought uh, the British ambassador played a, uh, an important role as a, a place, and, and, the, and the only explanation I can give was the food. So, uh, <laughs> cheap shot. Uh, but since I lived there for six years, I'm allowed to make uh, <laughs> such uh, comments. Okay, so let's start with the, uh, anyway, thank you for doing this. Thank you for inviting me. It's great uh, to be here. Let's I'm talk sorry, about it's my first time after three and a half years here. I should have come here from year one. I realize that You now. should have. Uh, I, mean, I, I blame it on bad staff work. Yeah. And, uh, so, now, but you are here, so that's good. So let's take advantage of it. Special relationship. It's a phrase that's constantly bandied about. But let's just, let's take a couple of minutes and set the baseline. What do you understand uh, the special relationship to be? And which, and I guess the question I'll, I'll ask at the, the risk of being slightly, uh, whatever, difficult, is whether in reality uh, it was less special than the, than the, the term would, would suggest. But let's just talk about it. What, what, what's the origins? What do we mean by the special relationship? And has it actually lived up to it? Yeah. Um, the phrase, of course, comes from Winston Churchill's speech in Fulton, Missouri at Westminster College in 1946, a speech that was better known for him coining the term about an iron curtain descending across Europe after the Second World War. Um, but he also talked about a special relationship between the UK and the US. Uh, and it's been around ever since. And uh, I mean, I don't myself use it every single public speech I make because I just think it can get overused. But why is the relationship special? Well, uh, you have to look across the whole breadth of it, whether defense and intelligence, where we have a 1,000 Brits embedded in your armed forces at any one time in 28 different states, where you and we have fought together through two world wars in the last century, um, and in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, since then, and in, and in Syria. And uh, uh, the intelligence relationship is so close that it is seamless. Um, and it's effectively like one you know, organization spread across uh, uh, two continents. But um, uh, after that cultural relationship, which is extraordinarily strong, uh, loads of history, you're our biggest trading partner. There's $1.2 trillion invested in each other's economies. Um, uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of tourists, probably millions, coming in two directions. And the interaction between the two countries uh, is at an extraordinary level. But um, look, that doesn't mean that we don't disagree occasionally. If I look at my own um, career, I mean, at the high points of us uh, together saving the world in the Second World War, um, but also fighting together in the First World War. Uh, and there were Brits fighting in Korea alongside you. Um, and then you look at the first uh, Iraq uh, conflict, which was a huge success. So there's a lot of, a long history of this together. But also in my career, there have been some big, big disagreements. Um, everyone thinks of Thatcher Reagan as the real pinnacle of the special relationship. They had some big, big disagreements, notably over the US invasion of Grenada. Um, where uh, Margaret Thatcher didn't feel she had been consulted properly or indeed at all before the invasion <laughs> yeah, happened. She, she had a point, actually. <laughs> and then you had um, uh, uh, Bill Clinton and John Major got along personally very well, 
two big disagreements, one over the handling of the Bosnia uh, civil war in Bosnia, um, and the disagreement culminated with the US basically unilaterally deciding to launch the Dayton Peace um, uh, Initiative and the Dayton Peace Conference, which, by the way, was one of the great pieces of, um, uh, of diplomacy of the last century, and you know, Dick Holbrook's finest hour, and did bring peace to Bosnia after several years of civil war, though Bosnia as a state barely functions. People don't kill each other anymore. Um, uh, and then there was a disagreement between Clinton and Major about, uh, about a, a travel visa for Jerry Adams as well, which was quite an issue at the time. Then if you go to Blair and Clinton, they were huge personal buddies, and I worked for Tony Blair as his Europe advisor, and I know that he had the great, he thought, he thought Bill Clinton was the most talented politician he had ever seen in action. But they had a big disagreement over whether we should threaten, and would have to carry it out if we needed to, um, ground troops uh, in uh, Kosovo when the air campaign wasn't working uh, in terms of, uh, of persuading the, Kurt, the, 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 the Serbs that they had to leave, uh, get, get out of Kosovo. So that was a disagreement. And then as you go on through, uh, through, um, through the 21st century, there have been more of them and at the moment. You know, we have a very good relationship with this administration, but we disagree about climate change, and we disagree about uh, US withdrawal from uh, Iran, and other issues out there. So it is special uh, across the breadth of it, across the depth of it, but it doesn't mean that there aren't moments, Richard, when, uh, when we have some quite sharp, uh, sharp disagreements. Yeah, there's nothing new. Uh, if you go back to 1956 in Suez, mm. when the Eisenhower administration... Maybe the biggest one of all, you're right. Yeah, basically threatened to uh, undermine the pound sterling. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, you know, this administration is known for the f using coercive financial diplomacy. Yes. Mr. Eisenhower was pretty good at it. Uh, uh, as well, um, during the Falklands, big disagreements, mm. particularly with elements of the US government that Mrs. Thatcher deemed were not sufficiently supportive. But it's got to be tough at times, because it's a relationship between unequals. Yeah. So it's one thing for us. It's nice to have a partner when we're off doing things. But it's, it's a totally different calculus from the British side, because, again, it's not uh, the scale of the two countries is fundamentally different. So what's the, what's the argument for the special relationship uh, on your side? An American friend once said to me, to your point about the unevenness of it, he said, you Brits, you kind of have you know, quite a nerve uh, in the way you deal with us because you supply about 10% of the resources to anything we're doing internationally for which you demand 49% of the input and the, uh, you know, the policy advice. And that's about right, yeah. I mean, sometimes we'd like 50-50, you know, or even more than that. Um, but uh, I like to think that on the US side, even if you have a pretty clear idea of where you want to go, it is useful to have someone which has got, which a country which has had a long history of international um, involvement I mean, globally, but obviously, especially a lot of a long history in some of the world's most common trouble spots around the Middle East uh, and uh, you know, a little further east of that, to bounce your ideas off and to consult and to see if we see things the same way that you do. Um, we also bring to special relationship, I think, really uh, top quality uh, security and intelligence understanding. And I think our intelligence agents contribute way more than 10% to our collective picture mm -hmm. of what is actually going on um, in the world. Uh, our special forces uh, are often so closely involved with yours that when you're deploying special forces, it's not kind of 10%, 90%, it's closer to 50-50 to because they're so closely embedded with each other. Well, let me, um, let me be slightly more negative because we've had some, first of all, uh, to, the queen, to the queen. <laughs> the queen. <laughs> the president. <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, so let's look at um, Tony Blair as prime minister. Yeah. Came under tremendous criticism at home for essentially being so junior a partner. And it's plagued his relationship ever since. Indeed, I would argue, sadly, that it weakens his ability to be a rallying point for the anti-Brexit forces in the United Kingdom because he's much more popular here than he is in your country. So yeah. clearly, a lot of Brits would say, he was too junior a partner. Mm. I'm a, 
I mean, I worked for Tony Blair as his Europe advisor from, in number 10, from 2004 to 2007 till he'd finished. And uh, a good friend of mine who was, uh, who became ambassador here before me, Nigel Scheinwald, uh, was the advisor on the rest of the world. And I always thought I had such an easy ticket compared to Nigel, because Nigel was going with news about, uh, about Iraq um, all the time. And I was reporting the occasional triumph on the European scene. So, um, so I remember those days vividly. Tony would still say to this day, uh, I'm sure, that um, he felt he did the right thing and the only thing that the UK could have done when asked by um, the Bush administration to support what, uh, what they wanted to do in Iraq. Um, we shared the same intelligence about uh, weapons of mass destruction being created in, in Iraq, and uh, you know, he felt it was absolutely the right thing, the right thing to do. I can tell you, Richard, that although I wasn't inside the room, because I was doing Europe and there was Nigel inside the room, they felt that in all of those meetings uh, between the US and UK teams with Bush and Blair at the table, that they were getting way more than 10% of the input and that they were persuading uh, uh, their colleagues, their American friends, uh, of certain policy positions or ways things should unfold, that the US side was agreeing with them. So uh, I remember seeing the team come back to number 10 time after time, feeling really quite buoyed by how the meetings had gone and what they felt was a really good measure of agreement. Mm -hmm. To be frank with you, it didn't always then turn into US policy uh, emerging quite the way we sure. thought had been agreed. But it didn't feel like a junior, junior partner then. It felt like um, the Prime Minister had a huge amount of influence over the President uh, at the time. And you know, Tony would never say and has never said publicly, look, if only you'd actually followed my advice, things would have worked out differently. He's taken the hit. Um, he's very active now on the Brexit debate. Um, yes, you're right that uh, it has made an impact on, his, on how he's seen in the UK, and he certainly has his critics there. But he is uh, unrepentant about what he did. And remember at the time, he went to Parliament and got a comfortable, healthy majority for uh, supporting you in Iraq. So he would say, look, you know, Parliament supported me. The country was supporting me. Which brings me to David Cameron, who two things come to mind in the context of this conversation. One was the vote uh, on using force against Syria after the Syrian use of chemical weapons in defiance yeah. of uh, the, the threats or challenges not to, he could not deliver parliament, yeah. which then uh, undermined whatever confidence Barack Obama had. And Barack mm -hmm. Obama then essentially used it as something of an explanation or excuse to back off acting. So there was, there was that, where in a funny sort of way, you had an unfortunate influence. And then David Cameron, even more faithfully, I would think, for the special relationship, uh, lit the fuse that became Brexit. And the reason I say more consequentially for the special relationship is one of the big arguments for the special relationship from our point of view was that our intimacy with the UK gave us extra voice in Europe. Mm. And so one question, so the, bring me back then to Brexit, which I knew we couldn't avoid, is to what extent do you fear or are you concerned that if, this, if Brexit goes ahead, an important American rationale for the special, special relationship disappears with it. Um, I'll come to that question. I promise I will answer just very quickly on David Cameron and, um, and the, the Syria bombing. I was National Security Advisor at that time, so this is kind of seared into my, into my memory. And I remember how it unfolded vividly. And uh, David and actually you know, pretty much everyone in the cabinet and certainly everyone in the National Security community in Whitehall, which I was leading at the time, believed that it was right to launch airstrikes against um, Assad for the, uh, the use of chemical weapons, the first, on, you know, the first time for almost uh, a century that, uh, that, that chemical weapons had been, had been used, and they were being used against civilians and children. Um, if you were in the House of Commons when that debate was happening and when uh, the, um, the vote was lost, Honestly, it felt as if, I mean, this may be unfair to those, those members of parliament who, who would take a different view of how that debate went, but it felt as if the Iraq war um, was a cloud hanging over the chamber 
a lot of people were kind of re-arguing what they had said when they supported the Iraq war when they were explaining why they weren't going to support the Syrian war. So Fair it enough. felt like a kind of re-litigation of all of that. And I don't think, certainly I as National Security Advisor, with my job being to prepare all the arguments for the Prime Minister for the debate, had not really anticipated that. So you know, um, it was a real moment for me. And I still think, mostly, uh, that it would have been the right thing to have done. I think David Cameron thinks it would, would have been the right thing to have done. And, you know, of all ironies, we did um, uh, actually participate in, in uh, airstrikes um, against Assad's um, uh, forces um, uh, under this president um, a year or two back. And yeah. that was the right thing to do as well. Um, look, on Brexit, there is one reality here, which is that... When we leave, we will not be sitting around that table. I was a master of the European Union, so I know that table well, with the other 27 member states, um, arguing, uh, and we would always say we'd be arguing for the British line, but it was usually a line we, you and we agreed on, on international and foreign policy issues, arguing what the, EU, what the EU position is. We were advocating something. Um, we'd never advocated something that only you thought we disagreed with, but we always, always agreed on these things, and we would be taking, therefore, a line that, that, that supported you. And it was important that, you, that we won the argument. And that won't happen when we're not around the table. There are some other angles to it, uh, Richard, and, and provided, and I'm sure we will, we live up to everything that our government is saying about an international-facing UK which is uh, active, which uses its its role on the UN Security Council, but which also continues to invest at more than 2% of GDP in our defense and security forces, so is, and is willing to deploy them uh, around the world um, uh, in pursuit of our, you know, of our national security, but also to make the world a better place. We may be able to do more of that, uh, and may be willing to do more of that um, uh, when we are uh, outside the EU. And uh, in things which fall short of military action, there is a tendency, to be frank, for EU foreign policy to emerge, as you know, having watched it over many years, as a kind of lowest common denominator. And when it's just us making national decisions, we may be able to, to, to take firmer, firmer international positions. And one of the features is uh, when we do sanctions now, we agree, agree them at 28. Sanctions are far more effective if you have 28 countries doing them than if it's just one. But if it's just one, we will certainly be able to have more freedom to uh, do exactly what is right. You surprised me by one of the things you said a few minutes ago, that the current relationship between uh, our governments is good. And uh, I would say that for those of us observing from some distance, the relationship between President Trump and Prime Minister May is not, say, what it was between President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher or, or Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, and I could go on and on and mm. on. But the interesting prospect, if Ladbrokes is right, uh, Boris Johnson will be stepping into number 10 sooner than later. Uh, Donald Trump has made no secret of his desire that uh, Boris Johnson becomes prime minister. So might we see a revival? Might the relationship become more special? I think you'd be surprised, Richard, if you'd sat in on a couple, at least, of the meetings between Theresa May and President Trump had actually, despite very different personalities and different styles in the way they approach meetings, um, how well they sometimes not got on. Of course, they had disagreements as well, but, but they got on better than, than, than you think. But on, um, on Boris Johnson, I mean, there's two candidates left. Remember, and Jeremy Hunt, Foreign Secretary, is still there. So uh, let's not assume that it's Boris. Were it to be Boris, um, it is the case that uh, this is a guy who used to have an American passport, who is deeply, instinctively um, pro-American. As foreign secretary, he came over probably four times while I've been ambassador here. And uh, he loves this place. He loves the country. He loves Washington. And uh, his style, um, which is you know, quite flamboyant in the way that he he does public speaking, and he's very funny, uh, and does he's he very knowledgeable. He doesn't tweet that much, but who knows? He may start. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's something to look forward to. But he gets on really well here, and he is, I think, very popular here. Um, and he doesn't know the President Trump. It's not a long relationship. They met in New York a year or two back when Boris represented 
the Prime Minister at an event that the President was chairing. But they got on very well when they met, and the President has made no secret of his regard for Boris, though he's also said nice things about Jeremy Hunt. So it's not kind of like he's thrown everything behind, uh, behind one candidate. So if it is, if it is Boris Johnson, um, I am sure they will get on extremely well. I'm sure that they will meet soon. I'm sure that they will talk very often, because this is a president who does a lot of business on the telephone. And uh, I think I'll have a lot of work to do. Say a little bit about what it's like to be Her Majesty's ambassador working in a Washington, which is different from most of the Washingtons I remember, and yeah. probably you remember. This administration is something other than the textbook yeah. and how it uh, operates. I mentioned Twitter. The interagency process is uh, at times less than orderly. <laughs> There's a degree of uh, concentric circles and presidential reaching out mm. to people, relatives and others who are outside the normal line or chain of uh, command. So what's it like to be an ambassador in this Washington, uh, other than interesting? Other than interesting. I was giving my first word in reply. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, look, before I came out here, I did two things. I went to um, see pretty much all the previous British ambassadors to the US who are still alive and chatted to them all about how it was and tried to learn from their experience. And then I did um, a month with my wife incognito um, before I was actually appointed here, driving ourselves around the deep south and the southwest and Florida. We did. We drove from Nashville to um, New Orleans, as you would say. New Orleans, we would say. New Orleans. So where are you going? Tell the people where you're going next. Um, where I'm going next yeah. from here, yeah. uh, I am going up to Montana, <laughs> which I said Montana, and if you laughed at me. So anyway, Montana. I'm going up to Big Sky Country for a couple of days over the weekend and, and next week. But anyway, we drove, from, we drove through the Deep South, and we went across to Utah, uh, and then uh, we drove around Florida. And you know, in the evening, being law abiding citizens, rather than if we like to have a glass of wine in the evenings, we would go out to restaurants in the towns we were staying in, places like Jacksonville, Mississippi, by Uber. And every Uber driver, I said, So who's going to win your election in 2020? Every single one of them in the Deep South, in the Southwest, and in Florida said Donald Trump. At a stage way before any, po I came up to Washington my first week here. Had all the oh, this is the election around. 2016, just to be clear. It's 2016, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. 2016. 2016. Yeah. Um, and uh, I come up to Washington, and the first week we have a pundit's breakfast, and all the Washington um, experts came around, and they all said, well, it won't be Donald Trump who wins the election, but, you know, <laughs> named all the other candidates. Interesting experience. Anyway, what's it like to be ambassador uh, here? First thing to say is, Look, this is an administration which may operate in some unconventional ways, but we Brits find them very congenial because a lot of them seem to have had long experience of the UK and to kind of like us for whatever mysterious reason there is. So it feels like an administration that is full of Anglophiles. So, which, which means, by the way, it's very easy to get in to see people, to get in to see your cabinet secretaries, to get in to see senior people in the White House here. I mean, Mick Mulvaney, current chief of staff, is a very good friend of mine. And I talk to him, it feels like, certainly every week. Um, but it feels like you talk to him daily if you wanted to, because he is he's such a good guy and, and seems to like us. So in that sense, that's very easy. It does operate in unconventional ways. Richard's quite right. There isn't the, the interagency process that we used to try to lock into, and as Richard said, to be a kind of virtual presence around the table. That doesn't meet so often nowadays, so you have to work in different ways. There are two or three things that are different. One, I didn't think my predecessors, when they woke up in the morning, the first thing they did was have a look at Twitter to see what the president had said overnight. And I do, because there's usually something in there that's quite interesting. Um, second, I don't think my predecessors have tried to influence the direction of US policy by going on the cable news channels um, one cable news channel in particular to set out our policy of it. We would go into the State Department or into the White House and say this is what we think. But it can be quite effective to actually appear on some of these cable news channels and say this is what we think. You never know who you might be, who might be watching. Um, and so in the future you can, pretend, you can present your credentials to Rupert Murdoch. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, no, no. <laughs> third thing, third thing is that the President 
runs alongside his cabinet and his White House advisers, we know that there are some people he consults who are not actually in the White House or in the administration. There are some prominent senior senators and congressmen whom he consults. There are some people in the media world that he consults. There are people who have been long-time business friends of his consult. And we try and, without making this sound like a great conspiracy, we try and know as many as possible of those people and talk to them about what we think about issues. And I mean, for example, Lindsey Graham is a great friend of the, uh, of the Brits and of the British Embassy and is, I believe, very influential with the President. And so talking to Lindsey, I'm sure you do it too, Richard, about foreign policy issues can be very productive. So it's a kind of, you know, I mean, this is the term I've learned a little bit about basketball. It's a full court press approach. You know, you try and get everyone who might be on the same side of the argument as you, who might be talking to the president to, um, uh, to know what you think about things and encourage them to talk to the president. It's actually flooding the zone. But flooding the right. zone, right. <laughs> Uh, well, well, I tried, didn't yes, I? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't explain cricket. Don't worry about it. The one last question, then I want to open it up, which is about Brexit. Because you said, I think, unless I misheard you, I think you said something about when Brexit happens, or when Britain leaves Europe. And so, I, um, one, I was a bit surprised with that. And my own, my own reading of it is it's likely, but not definite. And one can imagine various things. But if it were to happen, particularly if it's a no deal or quote unquote hard Brexit of some sort, with because uh, I for one can't imagine your former friends in the EU giving you a significantly different deal than mm. they've already offered you. Um, are you worried that the United Kingdom in 10 years will no longer be the United Kingdom? And that Northern Ireland and Scotland may go their own ways in order to keep in Europe? That Are you, are you concerned about what Brexit uh, might well set in motion? In today's politics, which you can never say anything is impossible because so many unexpected things happen. But I use the word when in terms of Brexit, first of all, because that's my government's position. And uh, you know, the two candidates, see the Prime Minister, are both also determined to deliver Brexit. And second, because the main opposition party although there is quite a lot of debate within that party, is also um, uh, currently committed to delivering Brexit. And it was 17.4 million people who voted for it and 16.1 million against. And although I worked for many years on the European Union, you know, I believe in democracy and you have to kind of um, uh, accept the verdict of the people and then make the best of delivering it. Um, what is going on at the moment now is we're trying to get a, a Brexit deal that, um, that best delivers what the British people voted for, though with minimum uh, impact uh, to existing economic uh, and commercial relations. It was one that gives us the opportunity to continue to be very close trading and economic partners with Europe while developing new and stronger trade relations with the rest of the world. I believe Personally, uh, it's not just because it's my government's position that no deal Brexit would be extraordinarily disruptive and would lose jobs in the UK and should, uh, if at all possible, be avoided. Um, and so I think that we... You know, I hear what you say, Richard, and certainly that's what the European Union um, is saying uh, publicly, that no deal other than the one Prime Minister Theresa May negotiated is going to be possible. Well, we'll see, because I think whoever wins the Tory leadership um, election will go to Brussels and look for some changes. I think probably the foundations of that deal, the withdrawal agreement between um, the, the Theresa May's team negotiated, a lot of that will be kept. But I think we'll have, have to be looking for changes on the backstop, which is the issue that the Irish backstop, which is the issue that a lot of people in the, in the government party, in the Tory party, uh, have issues with. And we'll see if... Uh, if, if if, there is, if it really is impossible to get some changes there. But I think it's very important that we leave with a deal and not with uh, no deal Brexit, which I think would genuinely be extraordinarily disruptive. I mean, we would come out of it after a period of time, but the damage that would be done, uh, meanwhile, people who might lose their jobs would, um, would worry me a lot. So I'm going to say something for 45 seconds. You can close your ears, and you certainly don't have to <laughs> respond. But as an American, I am uh, stunned by what I would find the... Uh, stubbornness of the Tory and British political establishment. 
the idea that the one-time referendum is, is, is etched in stone when it was a referendum based upon the idea of Brexit without knowing what the deal would be like amidst all sorts of disinformation, some put out by the advocates, some put out by the Russians. I find the idea that it's one and done and democracy has uh, spoke, the people have spoken and we can't revisit it now that we actually know what Brexit would mean. I find one of the weakest political arguments I have encountered in uh, years, and I find it quite tragic, and you don't have to respond to it. One American's uh, <laughs> view, and I also think, I'd say one other thing for ourselves, because I think we lose in this. I actually think we, I think Britain comes out weaker for it. We lose something of a partner. Uh, I think it also, it's, it's, it suggests to me the danger of democracy via referendum. When the, when the founders founded this country, we created, as in yours, a representative democracy. And direct democracy, I would argue, has certain uh, risks in, uh, implicit or inherent uh, in it. And then any doubts about it, I would suggest, are uh, Brexit has uh, erased. But you don't have to respond to any of that. Uh, so I don't uh, want <laughs> <laughs> let's open it up. Any questions about special relationship, Brexit, things the United States, the United Kingdom work on? Sir. Uh, sir, could you try to explain to us the soft border issue and how it doesn't become a sieve? Our newspapers have done a terrible job explaining anything about Brexit, but especially this issue. Do you mean the, the, the backstop, the issue between... Uh... Uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland. Richard actually has done some extraordinary <coughs> valuable work on Northern Ireland as a, as a kind of special representative we asked him to do a few years back, which hasn't yet quite delivered the deal that we like to, but it's, no, it's not down to Richard. It was an extraordinarily good piece of work. Um, it would take, to give you the full detail on the Irish backstop, it would take 10 minutes, but here's a very, a very, my, my quickest version of it. Um, we had many years of really tragic um, uh, troubles in Northern Ireland between the Protestant and Catholic communities there, uh, with a lot of people dying with um, shootings, uh, killings, bomb outrages, um, including on the British mainland. Um, first John Major um, in the late 1990s, and then sealed by Tony Blair, did a thing called the Good Friday Agreement, um, which I think uh, was signed in 1998, around Easter 1998, which basically, um, uh, it brought the two communities, representative communities, including Sinn Féin, including representatives of the IRA, into a coalition leadership for Northern Ireland and self-rule. And you know, we had to take some really difficult decisions as a part of that, including people who we thought had been terrorists actually you know, uh, weren't, were released from prison, and some of them actually then became uh, politicians representing parts of their community. Um, one part of that deal was the deal said um, to the Protestant community, as long as the majority of Northern Ireland want to be part of uh, the UK, that will be the UK government's position. So they felt reassured that in doing this deal with their enemies, um, they were not suddenly going to find themselves part of uh, the rest of Ireland, that Irish unification was going to happen. But for the Catholic community, the big plus point was the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland was completely open. Um, we're all in the European Union, so we had the same customs regime. So you could live on one side of the border and work on the other. And for practical purposes, it felt, no doubt, as if it was one country. If you, as a result, if we leave the European Union, that border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland becomes the border between the UK and the European Union, because the Republic of Ireland is part of the European Union. So if you then have tariffs and quotas and other trade measures between the UK and the EU, you would have to have customs posts and border posts, if you have visas or anything like that, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So that part of the Good Friday Agreement, which was so important to the Catholic community, um, disappears. And that potentially can wreck the whole, the whole deal. Um, and you will get a return to what we saw in the 1980s and 1990s, which obviously no one wants. So it's been a commitment of the British government from the outset that there will be no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. The way you get there ultimately is that 
after we have left the European Union, you have a free trade deal between the UK and the EU, which would mean you didn't need any tariff, uh, they had no tariffs and no quotas and whatever, so you wouldn't need any, any border controls, any, any customs controls on that border. Um, but until you get there, what the Irish backstop says is that the UK will stay inside the customs union or a customs union so that we don't have controls on that border. And part of the Conservative Party thinks that is potentially a trap which locks us into the European Union indefinitely. And that's why the Irish backstop is so, is so controversial. But uh, obviously I believe in the government position on this, genuinely, personally I do, which is the Northern Ireland uh, peace deal, the Good Friday Agreement, is such an important part of modern Britain, having resolved you know, centuries of troubles between the two, com two, two communities, but you know, particularly the troubles that I lived through in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that, uh, that's, you know, that has to be preserved. And that's the most important single objective. And that's why the government has been saying that, uh, that we have to stick with the backstop. I have a slightly different take on this in one minute. Just so you know, I was the U.S. envoy for the Northern Ireland peace process, and then I was brought in by the parties themselves as the international uh, mediator. And my own view is this could change the debate a little bit in Northern Ireland. And it gives, up to now, we thought demographics might be the driver mm -hmm. one day of uh, Catholic community was increasing at a faster rate than Protestant, and whether one day that those numbers would reach a point where a border poll, people voting on both sides, this would change the numbers. But I think if Britain, if Britain leaves Europe, you can then basically argue for Irish unification on the basis that, therefore, it keeps you in Europe. And I think it changes the argument somewhat in uh, the North, and it goes beyond a, uh, a, a religious or community-based uh, argument. So, uh, and it's ironic just because the Protestant community, the so-called unionists, uh, voted for Brexit. Yet they could set in motion, again, dynamics that could ultimately bring about a political outcome, which is exactly the opposite of what it is they want. So I would simply say, I think, you know, stay tuned. You know, what's interesting about politics so often is the unintended consequences. And I think this could have some uh, unintended uh, consequences. You can think it's for better or for worse, depending on your politics. But I think this, is, this will play out in very interesting ways. Yes, ma'am, in this next to last row there. Richard, Ambassador, uh, excellent session, thank you. My question is about the latest friction point in the special relationship, which would seem to be Iran. Your Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, told Parliament two days ago that he could not envision joining a US-led war on Iran, and your government has not been shy about saying you think that leaving the nuclear deal was a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. So my question is, if this conflict deepens and if things get worse instead of better, is the UK with the US? The differences between the UK and, uh, and the administration on Iran um, are around the JCPOA. We would have liked the US to stay in the, in the nuclear deal with the, the JCPOA. But we agree and have always agreed with the US that Iran shouldn't be developing ballistic missiles, particularly ones with a range that would reach European capitals, and that Iran's activities in the region, whether in Syria or in Lebanon, where they're supporting Hezbollah, or in Yemen, where they're supporting the Houthis, or in Iraq, where there are these highly disruptive Shiite militia gangs, um, are malign and damaging uh, to peace and security, stability and security in the Middle East, and should be stopped. So our preference, um, uh, our policy has always been keep the JCPOA. No one ever says it's a perfect agreement. If John Kerry had had another couple of years um, in the job, he might have actually been able to negotiate something on ballistic missiles as well. But keep the JCPOA because that's a kind of banker and that constrains the Iranian nuclear program uh, or did when it was signed for at least a decade. And by the way, people always talk about, you know, after some of these sunset clauses expire, then what can they do? But there are lots of different sunset clauses of different durations, and there's 
you know, there's one of 10 years, which is number of, uh, of centrifuges you have, but then there's one of 15 years, I think, around quantity of enriched uranium, and then there are others that are more or less indefinite. So it's not as simple as after 10 years they can do what they want. It never was. And we always intended, anyway, a few years before the sunset clause expired, to go back and say, you're not going to be now allowed to develop a nuclear weapon, so let's now renegotiate this. But anyway, you nail down the constraints in the JCPOA, and then you press the Iranians. And we still have two, the Europeans still have 200 odd different sanctions on the Iranians. So it's not like we're saying they're fine now, you know, there's no problem at all. We have sanctions on them over their regional activities, sanctions on them over the ballistic missiles, sanctions on them over their human rights abuses. So there's a lot of you know, pressure on the Iranians still. But keep the JCPOA, negotiate on ballistic missiles, and press them to stop doing what they're doing on, um, on uh, uh, their regional activities. Now, um, we hope that the Iranians will stay inside the JCPOA, and we have been publicly clear that we, th we deplore and we think it's completely un un, you know, uh, 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 impermissible in any sort of international law terms for them to attack civilian shipping in the Gulf. Something they did, by the way, back in the 1980s as well. Um, so if they continue to harass shipping in the Gulf, there will be consequences to that. My ministers haven't spelled out what they are, but there will be consequences. Um, if they continue doing what they're in the region, there are potentially consequences there. And if they breach the limits in the JCPOA, there'll be a bit of process we will go through in terms of using the mechanisms in that agreement, the dispute resolution mechanism, the joint commission, um, to see if we can persuade them to come back into compliance. But ultimately, there are consequences if they stay outside, if they leave the JCPOA as well. So putting lots of pressure on them that uh, they shouldn't do that. Plus, uh, I admit freely, we are looking for ways in which we can make the JCPOA work for them, given that some of the economic benefits they expected from the JCPOA, in terms of international companies trading with them and investing in them, are not happening because US sanctions, understandably, companies feel they have to make a choice between trading with the US and trading with Iran. They're always going to choose the US. So that has happened. And so we are looking for any ways which we can bolster the um, Iranian economy, not selling them weapons or anything, um, but uh, selling them um, humanitarian goods and maybe consumer goods as well. So um, the short answer is we hope it's not going to get to a confrontation between the US and uh, Iran. And we felt the president took the right decision when he appeared to call the all back, the all strikes, the, the airstrikes back you know, an hour or two, maybe it was 10 minutes, I think he said in a tweet, before he was actually going to press the button. That was the right decision, we felt. Um, and we hope that uh, the Iranians won't do anything, won't make any miscalculations now. But in terms of what happens if the Iranians breach the JCPOA or continue to harass civilian shipping or do any other things that could, by the way, we have plenty of people around the Middle East and the region too who are potential targets for them, then in those circumstances, then all bets are off on what might happen. If the administration came to you and basically said, uh, we're prepared to give the uh, Iranians a diplomatic off-ramp, mm. they would have to sign on to a JCPOA 2.0 yeah. that would extend the constraints, say, another 25 or 50 years, where they couldn't accumulate significant amounts of mm. fissile material or centrifuges. They'd have to accept constraints on ballistic missile range in exchange for which they would get a degree of sanctions relief. Uh, do you think you'd sign on to that? I, think I mean, this is way beyond my pay grade to make policy up on, on the hoof in <laughs> front of this audience. But I think we'd find that a very interesting and uh, an attractive, uh, attractive suggestion, Richard, yes. Ms. Tet, I see in the back of the room. For those of you who do not know Gillian, she, uh, she works for that salmon-colored newspaper uh, of some excellence. <laughs> some excellence, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm curious, um, when the president went to London recently, one of the issues at the absolute top of the agenda was a UK attitude towards Huawei, because you know that has been a point of some friction in the sense that the US has obviously taken a very tough line on Huawei, and the UK has continued to use it to some degree. And the UK intelligence services have indicated they don't necessarily share the same level of concern 
that has been pres um, um, presented by the president. So I'm curious, do you think that there's going to be a serious breach over that? Would that have implications for intelligence sharing? Um, or do you think the UK will simply come in line in the end with the U US position on this? Or do you think the US position is overblown? Right, Julian. I mean, that's, a, that's quite a tricky question. Um, <laughs> she is good at what she does. I know, I know. I, mean, I was praying no one would ask you about Huawei. First thing to say, and this is, if I want to do a very short answer, it is this, that the UK has, uh, I mean, we've had a couple of National Security Council discussions of it, but we have not taken a decision, and the decision will be for the new Prime Minister, um, and whether he takes it quickly or spends a little time to ponder over it, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't myself expect it to be one of the first things that he decides in the, uh, you know, in the dog days of, um, of August. So I think it may take a little time. Second point to make, though, is um, it sometimes looks as if we have a bigger difference with the US on Huawei than we really do. There has never been any question in our sensitive communication systems um, uh, one's uh, connected with national security, one's connected with um, you know, military communication systems um, or uh, uh, you know, stuff like uh, our emergency services and so on. Never be any question of using um, uh, Huawei equipment in that. We don't. Um, Huawei equipment is in our commercial networks but not in the sensitive government ones. Now, what we said about 5G is we are not going to compromise, and national security is very important, we're not going to compromise it, so we're not going to put Huawei equipment um, you know, in the nationally security of sens national security sensitive bits of uh, the future 5G networks, won't be in the government networks, won't be in intelligence or security or military networks or whatever. Um, I'm not a great technical expert, but I've tried to do a bit of analysis study of this. Um, it's not clear to me that using Huawei equipment in your commercial networks um, carries with it even significant national security risks. So when we have debates with our US friends about, uh, about the risks, if there is a difference, that's where it is. But I have to say I don't think that there is a completely solid, unified US view on the technical risks there. But anyway, um, when it comes to commercial networks, by the way, there's lots of Huawei equipment in US commercial networks at the moment because it's the cheapest kit. And so if you are running a mobile network in, in, um, uh, in a rural area. In Montana. Montana. I, 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 was, I was avoiding saying Montana, but you said it for me. Um, then you'll find Huawei, it's full of Huawei kit because it's the cheapest. And you know these, these net, rural networks run on quite a a narrow profit. Um, uh, there is a different argument here, which is about whether um, uh, we should, all of us, not use Huawei equipment as part of um, combating or responding to the strategic challenge that, that in, in Washington they, they say that China represents for the future. It's a kind of different argument. But again, I mean, the president sometimes says publicly and privately that uh, he sees the Huawei issue primarily in the context of US-China trade. So you do wonder if there is a US-China trade deal in the next uh, 12 months, whether the current restrictions on Huawei will be lifted as part of that. Um, so I don't know exactly what, I think I'm not sure I know exactly what the US position is on this. So yeah, where does it come to? Me, by the way. Right, where does this come to? Um, we will put national security absolutely foremost in our calculations and our decisions on um, what we do um, about our 5G network and whether we allow Chinese equipment. By the way, the main competitors, Nokia and Ericsson, also make all their stuff in China, just saying. Um, but that doesn't, you know, whether we end up with a full ban on Huawei or just a, if you like, a partial ban, because it's not in any of the sensitive bits of our networks, is something for the next Prime Minister to decide, and both options are possible. Got time for a few more questions. Yes, sir, here in the second row. Uh, so I hand over there somewhere. Richard mentioned the uh, potential Russian 
um, interference in the Brexit vote. Um, in, in our country, we have obviously the same issue in our 2016 election. We investigated that by our president asking the Russian president whether it happened and was denied. Um, what, if anything, is the UK doing to investigate potential Russian interference in the Brexit vote? In our defense, we also investigated in other ways. The <laughs> intelligence community did come out with a joint position about Russian interference, and the Mueller report is pretty explicit. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, there are two things that have happened. One, a number of, and I'm a, you know, I'm a huge admirer of the, of the media, honestly, and um, you know, there have been some very good journalists who have looked into this and have written um, uh, a lot of stuff about Russian interference with Brexit, which is fascinating. Um, and quite what was going on, and there's a huge amount of really good research going to that, and I admire them for that work. But in terms of what the government has done, we gave this issue to the Electoral Commission, our independent Electoral Commission, whose job it is to look at whether elections have been conducted fairly or not. And by the way, they have teeth. I mean, they, they have um, fined uh, at least one party um, over it uh, in the whole Brexit debate. Um, uh, they've, they find the, the, the Leave campaign over exceeding some of the limits for what you could spend and some of the other rules. And they concluded, I believe, that although there had been um, some Russian activity that it was not significant um, in the end result. So that's, that's where it's been left, but it's been investigated and it's their job to do it. That's interesting. That means your investigations made a judgments that our never, ours never did, mm. which is whether it had any impact. We've only described what we know of Russian involvement. We've never made an assessment mm. of whether it had any effect uh, one way or the other uh, on the election. That's interesting. There's a gentleman over there who had his hand up. Yeah, good. Oh. Yes. Hi, oh, thank you. Uh, well, hi, uh, Richard. Well, you mentioned it at a certain point before that with England out of Europe, the special relationship would probably diminish. And, of course, there are other ways to maintain it. And at the recent event with uh, English and American uh, political scientists, um, the Brits were very excited about the idea of the Anglosphere to, to introduce as, as a substitute. And, uh, and because the, the attitude was on the 10%, 50% uh, that we were discussing before, uh, an American, very senior American banker took the floor and, uh, and said, well, actually, it's a good idea. We could probably buy England and annex it. Um, so the question is, what can you tell us about the Anglosphere? <laughs> and would, uh, would, um, would, would it be a good idea to have the UK up for sale, maybe? I think it depends yeah. on the exchange rate. But, exactly. Uh... <laughs> yeah. um, I think, uh, not that I want, uh, we need to debate about what I, what I said. I think what I said um, on leaving the European Union is one thing that, that was definitely going to change, and there's nothing one could do about it, was we wouldn't be around that table of 28, argue a case that happened to be consistent with American views on issues, uh, and that's just reality. But I hope I also said was that we would, I mean, there was a lot more to the special relationship or to the UK-US relationship than the UK acting as American proxy around the EU table, and that uh, released in some ways from some of the constraints of the European Union, that I hope we could be as valuable partner to the US, but in different ways. On the Anglosphere, look, it actually kind of functions and exists already in the form of Five Eyes, which is public knowledge that we, the Americans, the Canadians, the New Zealanders, and the, and the Australians, collaborate extremely closely on intelligence security matters. Um, there's no closer relationship than the UK, US, but they're all part of it. And it is uh, extraordinarily valuable um, and important. So in that sense, it's already there. Um, but you know, I don't think the Anglosphere as a kind of you know, a sort of geographical grouping beyond what we do together on intelligence and security and defense stuff doesn't, to me, make a whole lot of sense. I mean, obviously, we want to trade with everyone as much as we can, but I see that more as a series of bilateral relationships and something that is, that is collective. But look, that's just my view, um, and you will certainly find British politicians um, who see a big future for, for the Anglosphere and think that this can be one of the things that, that, um, 
that replaces our relationship with the European Union uh, in the future. Um, I'm a bit personally sceptical beyond the fantastically valuable stuff we do on security and intelligence, but I, you know, I may be wrong. Kim, you're one of the, your country's leading, if not the leading expert on the EU. Put aside Brexit for a second. How worried are you about the future of the European project? We see you know, the yellow jackets or whatever going on in France. We see the Italian government potentially yeah. not meeting EU uh, guidelines. We see the political uncertainty of Germany, the illiberalism of, of Hungary and Poland, Greece, financial difficulties, what have you. Uh, when you look at the European project after now nearly three quarters of a century, uh, how confident are you of its future? Um, it's a good question, which I'm confident of its future, um, but I think it faces challenges way beyond those when I was doing this from, I did it basically from about 1995 to 2012, um, pretty much with a bit doing Bosnia and Kosovo in the middle. Um, and uh, those were much happier times for the European project than now. Um, and Brexit is the kind of tip of the iceberg, but there are lots of challenges below that, of which I would highlight two. Um, one is that uh, in the same way that you have a politically divisive and massive challenge on your southern border, we have the same measure of challenge, if not greater, um, uh, along the Mediterranean, um, because it sometimes feels as if, you know, almost the entire population of North Africa would like to come to Europe, understandably, for a better standard of living, you know, a better life there. And this was most starkly illustrated back in 2015 when, uh, with the Syrian civil war at a peak at that time, you saw literally a million and a half refugees, um, mostly coming through Turkey into Greece, but there were a number of channels across um, coming through uh, Eastern Europe on their way to Western Europe. Um, and that, by the way, I think was quite a big factor in, in the ultimate British decision, British right. population's decision to, uh, uh, to leave the European Union. And that migration challenge is still there. And there are so many routes across. There's a route across into Spain. There's a route, a route across into southern Italy. There's a route across um, from Libya into southern Italy. And there's a route across from Turkey into Greece. Um, and there just isn't an easy answer to it. If there was an easy answer, we'd have got there. Um, but until conditions, until there is sufficient political stability um, uh, and economic prosperity in those countries, there's always going to be people who want to leave and come to Europe. And Europe now is full to overflowing, it feels, with, um, with economic migrants. Um, and they're people, you have to understand why they aspire to a better standard of living, a better living for their children. But you know, it's putting huge political strains on Europe. You see that reflected in politics across mainland Europe. You see it in the rise of certain parties. Sure. You see it in the struggle of mainstream politicians to keep, to maintain the support of the population. And the second problem I would just flag up, not just two problems in Europe, but these are two that really worry me. Ever since um, 2008, uh, large parts of Europe uh, financial crisis they have struggled economically. There are still parts of the European banking system that really have big, big problems. And um, a number of countries in the European Union, to say they're mostly along the Mediterranean, um, just have had really poor economic growth for a decade now. And again, you see that appearing sure. in politics. Um, and uh, until mainstream political parties and politicians in Europe can demonstrate to their publics that they have answers to these problems and policies that are going to work. Um, we're going to have real problems and real challenges in Europe. And these are, these are really, really difficult things to solve. Kim, uh, I saved the most difficult question for last. I want you to be careful. I don't want to get you in trouble in how you answer this. This weekend, the Yankees and the Red Sox are playing a two-game series in uh, London. Who are, you, uh, who are you rooting for? Do you know, I have, I mean, most Brits don't get baseball any more than you Americans get cricket. But I've been going to baseball games since I first came to America in the 1980s, and I kind of love baseball. And I got into it through writing, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but there was a great writer who wrote in the most lyrical terms of American baseball called Roger Angel. 
Engel? The name. The New Yorker. New Yorker, yeah. Roger Angel. Uh, Angel? And he just he just was a beautiful prose still, stylist. Still, still writes. Um, and uh, uh, I've always just loved the idea of Fenway Park because it's just it's the wrong has answer. This. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to say I'm a Red Sox guy, uh, yeah. but of course I really support the Washington Nationals, who are two games off a 500 a season, which isn't the best, but you know. What you have just seen is proof that the special relationship <laughs> no longer exists. <laughs> uh, but you've also seen proof of uh, what I said before about how the United Kingdom continues to send us extraordinary diplomats. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.